Okay, I'm going to do a midweek update uh, because we had the CPI report out today and I was asked if I could do a midweek update. I'll try to keep it uh, as short as I can and get, uh, get to the main points. What are we looking at here? This is a two-week chart of the S&P futures. It's the uh, E-mini futures. Uh, on uh, September 7th down here, we were sitting around 3,900 and I thought, well, it looks like we're going to hang out around this, this level for a while, but nope, uh, that's not good enough for the market. It decided that it wanted a 260-point rally in six days ahead of the CPI report. Uh, and even up to the minute before the report was going out, futures were strong and green and hitting the highs, uh, almost at 4160. Uh, and then this is what you had. And the belief was, well, because the narrative in here, uh, you know, kept rebuilding again, uh, you know, that the Fed is going to pivot, the Fed is going to pivot, uh, comma, because they're going to have to. The Fed is going to pivot, comma, because they're going to have to. And during that whole time, it's like, no, no, we don't have to take earnings expectations down. The economy is going to get bad and the Fed is going to pivot. But leave earnings expectations unchanged. You can't have both. You know, if you, if you think that the, if you don't believe the Fed after everything they said, that you think the economy is going to get so bad, it will force them all to eat crow, turn around and pivot then you have to lower earnings expectations. You can't just say, no, earnings expectations are going to be just fine. You just don't touch those. But the Fed is going to pivot. They're going to have to. Well, that narrative, something's wrong with that narrative. Meanwhile, while this was going on, the bond market had it right because long, long uh, uh, bond yields, capital market yields were going up. Uh, so the market, the market, the fixed income market had it right. The equity market had it wrong. And down we go. So let's uh, get right to the inflation report. All right, when you download the report, the link is in the description box. Go to table one. Table one has the weights. And uh, the last column here is the month over month uh, for August, August over uh, July. And uh, BLS, a word over here. You got three decimal places over here. I don't need three, six point, point, point six nine one. Point 0.69 is good enough. All these extra decimal places you have, if you're worried about you know too much ink being used, Take them out of here and add them here because this could be 0.544 or it could be 0.644, for example, and you would round it both to 0.6. Well, there's a lot of information lost in there. If I'm trying to annualize the one month rate to come up with a one year expected. So come on, work with me on this one. If you annualize this 0.6, you get to 7.44 on core. That's a forward looking uh, estimate. If you take the last three months, average of the last three months and annualize that you get to 6.44 on an annualized basis so somewhere between six and a half and seven and a half percent uh on a forward-looking basis we'll look at uh, the cleveland fed shortly they give us the median and the trimmed mean C uh, cpi the th the thinking or the thought was that you would see deflation in the goods component here is the goods component here it makes up 21.16 of the 77.69 and services make up 56 percent of that uh, roughly 78 percent and the thinking was you'd see deflation here but not only in uh, used vehicles uh headline uh, on this category was 0 0.5 0 0.6 on services uh, we know that shelter makes up 32 percent if you uh, listen uh, to uh, the market outlook every week that 32 percent should be in your head by now because we go through this every every month Owner's equivalent rent, 23.6, and rent itself, 7.2. Look at that, 0.7. Um, we also, uh, in a previous uh, market outlook, uh, looked at the relationship between housing prices and owner's equivalent rent, and we saw a 16-month lag. On average, about a 16-month lag from when housing prices rolled over to when owner's equivalent rent peaked and rolled over. And if we're generous and we say that housing prices peaked in February, if this is August data, we're six months in to uh, the housing prices rolling over, which means on average we've got 10 more months of rising owner's equivalent rent before it peaks and rolls over. Um, one thing that that relationship did not show when I presented it was it didn't show the state of supply at the time uh, that owner's equivalent rent, or sorry, that the housing prices peaked and rolled over. In all those other periods of time, you had a well-supplied market. We don't have a well-supplied market right now, so I don't think that that 16-month lag even, even will hold. This could be multiple years 
before this component rolls over and it's 32 percent the other big component in cpi which we do not see because these are the final prices of goods and services uh, is um, the input component of labor because within all of the prices is a labor component and we looked at the atlanta uh, feds wage tracker on sunday because we had the september uh, labor report we saw no change june july august 6.7 6.7 6.7 there was no decrease in the growth rate so we 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 are not expecting that uh to to uh roll over in these numbers here whatever labor component is in these numbers is not there also i think that going forward we have a bit of a problem with labor I think that it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Sure, we have participation rate that increased. That's nice to see. Uh, but we also have labor pushing back against the wages. Even with the wage increases that have happened, you see them pushing back. State of California has decided the fast food workers will be making, I think it's 22 bucks an hour now. Uh, railway workers are expected to strike by the end of this week unless they get their deal. And they've got a big ask. Uh, they're not asking just to cover inflation here. I think they're, they're asking like 15%, something like that, 15% wage increase from where they are now. Uh, well, I mean, uh, that's railway workers. How much stuff travels on the railway? All of that's going to find its way into end, uh, end consumer prices. Uh, and um, you've got uh, 2023 is a, uh, for the auto workers is a union negotiation year. Uh, and usually the first they deal with one company uh, and then every other company falls in line from that one last time i think was gm first and, and gm suffered a one month strike because of it uh, this year i don't know who's first but it won't be gm because uh, they were first last time uh, but do you think that they're going to uh, be friendly i don't think so uh, i think that a lot of the wage negotiation going forward is going to be aggressive I think there was a three-day strike of health workers in, what is it, Minnesota as well. Uh, so that wage component is going to get a little bit more aggressive. Uh, I think uh, earlier in the year, I had shown the relationship between net income margins uh, and GDP. That net income margin as a percentage of GDP was running around 115 to 12%. Uh, and the long-run mean reverting level had always been around 6%. So that net income margins of corporations are double what they have been uh, at least for the last 10 years. Now you have labor saying, hey, we want a bigger part of that. So I, I don't know that CPI, the core, the core is going to roll over the way the market thinks it's going to roll over anytime soon. Let's look at what the uh, Cleveland Fed has for us in that respect. Okay, from... Uh Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland uh, updated schedule. Let's check this. Last updated September 13th. So that's good. Change in median CPI 0.7%. There they are. One decimal place like the BLS. And uh, the 16% trim mean uh, plus 0.6 in August. So let's make sure we know what these are. It tells you right here. See, the median CPI is the one month inflation rate of the component whose expenditure weight uh, is the 50th percentile of price changes. I think the more meaningful one is the 16% trim because it says, okay, those things that really went up and really went down, let's get rid of those because they're probably far more flexible. And we'll just look at the middle uh, 84%. Uh, the CPA is a weighted average of one month inflation rates of components whose expenditure weights fall below the 92nd percentile and above the 8th percentile of price changes. Uh, I don't think this chart is updated, um, but uh, these numbers are and the tables are. Let's just go to the percent change over the past 12 months. And if you look at CPI, we'll look at the bottom two. Look at CPI. Uh, it increased all the way into June, 9.1. Then it moderated to 8.5, then to 8.3. So it looks like, yeah, okay, headline is coming down. If you look at the core, the core seemed to be coming down all the way through. 6.5, 6, 6, 2, 6, 5, 9. Went sideways at 5.9. We got our jump to 6.3 based on what we saw today, it pushed the core up. When you look at the median and the 16% trimmed, with the 16% trimmed, I think, being more meaningful, look at the direction. The median, 4, 9, 5, 2, 5, 5, 6, 6, 3, 6, 7, monotonically increasing. What about the 16% trim mean? 6, 1, 6, 2, 6, 5, 6, 9, 7, 7, 2. Both of these straight up, as you can see uh, what we had over here, both of these straight up. 
Uh, let's see if they are the right numbers. Uh, the trimmed 7.22, median 6.7. 7.226. Okay, I guess it is updated. It just seemed that uh, you'd put August 31st and not August 1st. If it were me, that's the way I would do it. Maybe they need to hire me to add a decimal place and uh, fix their chart. I wouldn't charge them much, but, uh, you know, something to think about, Cleveland Fed. Let's have a look at the uh, Fed Watch tool. On Sunday, there was a 91% probability of 75 basis points. 9% of 50. Uh, this morning, the 50 was gone. Altogether, there was an 88% probability of 75 basis points and a 12% probability of 100. I posted it on LinkedIn this morning. This is the end of the day. 100 basis points is now 33% probability and 75 is now 67%. Here's how you get this to 100% is the market decides to ignore this and say the fed's gonna pivot they're gonna have to and they jump right back on that old bandwagon and they rally 200 or 250 points into friday's close and then they rally they keep rallying into the fed meeting then the fed is going to go 75 for fundamental reasons and they're going to add 25 on for psychological reasons if you don't want a hundred point raise relax Let's hang out here for a while. There's plenty of work to do down here, by the way. There's plenty of money to be made down here. If you know how to work the options, there's lots of money to be made. Let's just relax. Otherwise, you're going to get a 100 basis point move, and down we go again. So on any rally, you know what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be selling calls against that rally easily. That's going to be an easy no-brainer for me. Uh, because I've done, I've taken the time, I've done the work, I've looked at the sticky components, I've real, I've seen how long they hang out. I looked at owner's equivalent rent. I see the relationship between. I've done that kind of groundwork as opposed to saying at a high level thing. Gasoline prices have come down. We're facing deflation. Forty eight hundred on the S and P by the end of the year. That is irresponsible. Look at that. Just today, yesterday, a hundred basis points didn't exist. This morning it was 12%, now we're at 33%. Okay, what we have on the screen here is the XLY. This is the uh, ETF which tracks the consumer discretionary sector of the S&P 500. <clears throat> it has a beta that is uh, higher uh, than, the, um, than the SPY. Uh, so its option premiums tend to be a lot richer. On uh, September 8th, uh, at 11 in the morning, I sold uh, 200, $170 calls, which uh, is off the top of the chart. It's somewhere up here. Uh, 160, what is that? 160, yeah, it's somewhere up here on the 170s. And I did that on September 8th at about 11 uh, when we were down here. Uncomfortable, uh, but uh, this was a beautiful day. And I think we ended somewhere around 2, 205. Uh, on these I'm going to continue to hold them uh, for a while these are October 170 calls I probably uh, will uh, pull them off 20 at a time so uh, if we have a little bit of a down day tomorrow I'll drop this down to 180 and I'll slowly work my way out when I drop this down because I sold these calls it adds negative dollar delta beta uh, so as I cover them I'm making this less negative which is uh, if we just draw something that looks like this there let's say that's the S&P and uh, let's say that this is where I think we should be uh, as I explained before if we're doing this and I don't believe it I add negative dollar delta beta and here I added it using XLY uh, because when you rally, uh, the implied volatility tends to fall. The premiums come out of the options. So the premiums on SPY drop. So dollar for dollar of margin, I got bigger premiums by using XLY as opposed to using SPY. And the correlation between XLY and SPY is about 0.96. So because it has a, such a high correlation, I thought, well, let's get the richer premiums. Let's go for the XLY as a proxy for a short on the market. So if I don't believe the rally, I'll add uh, dollar delta beta. As we get closer, I'll start to lighten up. And as we start moving uh, downwards, I'll look to add dollar delta beta. But around this range in here is uh, hopefully where I try to get neutral. 
uh, and the further down we go, the more, uh, the less neutral I want to become, the more long biased I want to become. Today's report doesn't change anything for me. Uh, I, I don't uh, see uh, why I wouldn't be interested in the market below 3,900 uh, as we start, if we push to 3,850 and 3,800. As we keep going down, I will start leaning past the neutral line to being net long on my dollar delta beta. And if tomorrow we decide, no, no, you know what, up we go, let's let's go up, uh, then I will play the same playbook and I'll begin to add uh, negative dollar delta beta as well. I'll uh, sign off here because I don't want to make this too long. Keep in mind tomorrow you have PPI. PPI is always follows CPI. It's less important, uh, but uh, you know it is important in its own rights. Uh, it is less important. The belief is, especially when you look at the intermediate stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, that uh, any inflationary pressure we see there will work its way into CPI at some point. So uh, you know if you're uh, trading through the night and you see that futures are increasing and you have access to Globex. And you say, aha, that was a one-day event. I'm going to jump on board. Keep in mind, you got another risk event tomorrow with PPI. You have no earnings to save you. Nothing. Nothing can save you at this point in time. There, the, the, next, the next signpost is the Fed next Wednesday. That's the next signpost. There's really nothing that's going to save us right now other than what's the narrative uh, and the Fed. That's it. So... Happy trading. Sorry, one last point. Let me take another 30 seconds. On Sunday, I had uh, talked about the applied series uh, and that on the 15th, the price was increasing from 220 to 320 because um, as we add more content, uh, the price will increase. The applied options course is done. I'm uh, halfway through the sector studies with the financials uh, going up soon. I think there's going to be six or seven uh, before I head to applied macro and top down. In in this, uh, heavy on intermarket analysis, if uh, if you like that. Um, but just just to let you know that uh, the the price here it is right here uh, as of September 15th will be 320. So if this is something that you were thinking about, it is 220. Uh, today's the 13th it's tuesday so all the way to tomorrow night at midnight all the way to the 14th it will be 220 uh, and at that point it rises to 320 uh, and it'll be that way till march 1st march 1st it'll go to 410 because uh more of these um modules will be added